Programmers often talk about the idea of encapsulation, which can be a very powerful tool and can save lots of frustration and prevent bugs as a project grows. Now, the idea of encapsulation is that a class or a system has everything it needs inside itself to function. It doesn't need to reach out for references, and it's not dependent on other classes and systems to function. This is decoupling of systems and classes, and we should generally be avoiding the coupling of classes and systems. And encapsulation is another tool to help us do just that. So before we dive too far into the command pattern, I want to say this is the last programming pattern on my short list. Now, there are certainly way, way more programming patterns out there. And if there's one in particular that you'd like to see me cover, let me know in the comments below. But let's get back to the command pattern. Now, the command pattern is all about sending information or a command to an object. And the command itself is what is being encapsulated. The sender and the receiver of the command are not necessarily encapsulated, but rather the command itself is. This means that all the information that is needed to execute that command is wrapped up inside that command class. What this means is that the object executing the command doesn't need any external references. All it needs to do is to tell the command to do its thing, and the command is fully independent and decoupled from other systems. While this requires some framework and intentionality to create, it can be very useful. It means that commands can be added to a list or a queue, run immediately, or run any time later. This adds or allows significant functionality that would otherwise be difficult to achieve with just direct function calls. This makes it great for asynchronous applications. One example may be a turn-based strategy game where a sequence of commands is created one at a time, and then all of the commands or a select number of commands can be run when it's that object's turn. The command pattern can also lead to an easy creation of an undo system, which depending on your project might be helpful or even crucial. For this video, we're gonna start simple, just using the command pattern to collect commands in a list and execute them later over a short time interval. We'll then add in the ability to undo and redo the commands. This will result in some messy code, but we'll finish up the video by wrapping up all that messiness into a command handler class, which ends up being pretty clean and tidy due to the commands themselves having all the functionality encapsulated inside of the command instances. Now, the core idea of the command pattern is to encapsulate the command in an object. And to do that, we first need to create an interface that will have two functions. The first function is the execute or do function. This will contain all the code for the command to complete its action. The second function is the undo function, which will need to have code that reverses or undoes whatever happened in the execute function. Now, exactly what that undo function looks like is 100% dependent on what the command is doing. For my example of moving an object, the undo function will be very straightforward. We're simply going to move the transform in the opposite direction. With the interface complete, we then need to create classes for the actual commands. For the purposes of this video, I'm just going to create one command, which is a move command, and this class will of course need to implement the command interface. In the move class, we need three variables. The first is the direction to move, the second is the distance to move, and the third is a transform that will be moving. All three of these variables are private and will have their values set in the constructor. By doing this, the command instance will have all the information and references that it will need to execute the move command. Now this is pretty clever in its simplicity, and it's also really clean. The execute and undo functions themselves are straightforward in that they change the position of the transform. Simple and tidy. I've also included a getMove function that is used in order to draw the path taken by this object. This certainly is not the only way to do it, and it's not particularly clean. But it gets the job done, and it's not the focus of this video. And frankly, it just made for better visuals in the video. So for the most part, I will be ignoring the path drawing functionality, as it's tangential at best to the command pattern. To control the object and issue the commands, I've created a few UI buttons. These are connected to a basic input manager. In the input manager start function, a listener is added to each button. The direction buttons all call a send and move command function, while the do turn button will call a function on the player object that will execute the list of commands. How exactly the input is gathered, of course, doesn't matter. But the send move command is crucial and does a few important things. This function takes in the transform to be moved, in this case, the player object's transform, the direction to move, as well as the distance to move. The function then creates a new instance of the move command and sends the command to the character controller. For my example, it also adds a command to a UI element that displays the commands on the screen. A better approach to sending out these commands would probably be to use the observer pattern, or in other words, use events but I didn't want to go too far astray from the command pattern and complicate the main idea of this video. 
If you aren't familiar with the observer pattern or events, definitely go check out my earlier video on that topic. It's easily one of my favorite and most used patterns. In our character move class, there is a list of move commands that each incoming command will get stored in. You can see this happening in the add command function. Now in general, the list could hold types of I command, but in order for my path drawing to work, I need to constrain the list to the more specific type. For simplicity, I'm not showing the code that does the path drawing, but if you want to see that, you can check out the full code in the link in the description below. Then we can look at the do moves function that will get called via the input manager when the do turn button is pressed. This function calls a coroutine that will iterate through the command list and call execute on the command and then wait a short time before moving on to the next command. And that's pretty much it for a basic implementation of the command pattern. You just wrap up the commands which contains everything that needs to happen and ship it off to a list for storage so it can be executed when needed. Again, simple, nice, and tidy. So let's take a look at how an undo system might work. The command interface and the move command class remain exactly the same. No changes are needed at all. The input manager is functionally the same, but now has an option for an undo button. This new button will call a public function on the character controller. Again, not the cleanest implementation as an event would likely be better. But the big difference comes in the character controller. Here, I'll modify the behavior by now having the player object move in real time as the buttons are pressed. Now this isn't necessary for the undo function to work, but I think it makes it easier to demonstrate the undo functionality. In order for the player object to move in real time, we simply need to execute an incoming command whenever that new command is added. Then new to the class is the undo command function. This function first checks that there is a command to undo by checking the number of commands in the command list. Then calls undo on the last command in the list and finally removes that command from the list. And that's it. A quick test in Unity shows this working perfectly. Now this is all super simple and it's all thanks to the command interface. When I first saw this, I was a bit surprised and even a bit shocked at how easy this could be. Now, of course, if the command is more complex, the writing and testing of the undo function will be more difficult and more time consuming. But the interface makes it easy to call that undo function and the inclusion or encapsulation of all the values and references provides a solid framework to create undo functionality. For many games, this may be enough, but if you want to also implement redo functionality, things are going to get a bit messier, or at least they are the way I did it. For a redo system, we could simply not remove commands from the command list and then execute them again when the redo button is pressed. Essentially, we're just going to be working our way up and down the list of commands. But there's a problem with that. If some commands are undone and then new commands are added, this will cause problems as those new commands would just get added to the end of the command list. So we need to modify our list and keep track of which command on the list we are currently executing or undoing. So yeah, sounds simple and it's not crazy difficult, but it does get a bit messy. So the first thing we need to do is add an index variable that can track which command on the list we are currently working with. With each additional command added to the list, the index will increment up one and with each command undone, the index will increment down one. This means we also need to change which command is being undone to correlate with the index and not just the length of the command list. With all that done, we now need to add a few lines to our add command function. We need to check to see if our index is at the end of the list. If it's not, then we need to remove all the commands between our index and the end of the list by using the remove range function. With this complete, we should be able to add commands, undo some of them, and add more commands without screwing anything up. If we were to test this, we'd see that we haven't really added any new functionality, but it does mean we can now add a redo command function. This function is actually fairly simple. We do some checks to make sure we don't get a null command or get an out of range error. Then we simply execute the command that correlates to the value of the index. And once again, the interface and the execute and undo functions makes this surprisingly simple. That is minus the tracking of the index. But there is still some overall ugliness to the solution. I don't like that this code is in my player controller. The add command, undo command, and redo command have nothing to do with the player controller. This code is generic and should be reusable. Remember that the whole point of the command pattern was to encapsulate the command so these functions and the list of commands could be just about anywhere. There is no need for all of this code to be in the player controller. And if you were making a game with multiple types of objects that could receive commands, it would be a pain and more importantly, error prone to repeat this code in multiple classes. So let's extract the command code and stick it into a command handler class. 
This class will contain a list of commands, an index, as well as functions to add, undo, and redo commands. Then in the player controller script, we simply need an instance of the command handler class. The final tweak here is to reroute our buttons in the input manager to call functions on the command handler. If we take a step back, what we have is really clean and surprisingly generic. Yes, we have a lot of classes, but that is often a trade-off with our programming patterns, and I think the cleanliness of the implementation more than makes up for the extra classes. Do note that this implementation has resulted in some loss of our ability to easily draw the path of the player. But I think with some cleverness, and especially if those commands are sent with events, this can be worked around without too much effort. So before we go, I had a few other thoughts on the pattern. So like many other patterns, it's not the exact implementation that's important, but rather it's the larger idea in the framework. While I use direct function calls, I think using events, i.e. the observer pattern, could be more generic and more powerful. And also, the command pattern may result in commands being created and destroyed with some frequency, which can create unneeded garbage collection. While not a problem with my simple example, it might be desirable to implement an object pooling solution to use with the commands if performance is crucial, or if you just want to squeeze out a few more FPS out of your game. So there we go. I hope that was interesting, or better yet, useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing.